So does anybody have any questions? No? No questions? Where are the best graduate schools if you want to study traditional metallurgy or corrosion? Um, the best <laughs> school happens to be MIT, okay? Uh, and there's a good story about that, about um, in the field of, uh, at MIT, the physics department doesn't like to admit their own undergraduates to graduate school. Richard Feynman, okay, didn't get admitted to MIT. He went to Princeton, and then he ended up at Caltech, and then he won a Nobel Prize. But he didn't get admitted to physics because there's lots of other good physics departments. And so you can argue that why? Why shouldn't you go somewhere else and see what, what's, you know, see the, see the horizon somewhere else? Um, it turns out when I was department head, I, I would have department heads from other universities say, we encourage our best students to go to MIT, why don't you encourage your best students to come to our university? And I couldn't say, because you're second rate. I mean, <laughs> okay, we're, are we on video? <laughs> okay, well I didn't say which schools were second rate. <laughs> okay, uh, but we really are number one, and in fact, in the area of material, in the, in the area of engineering, they just came out with the undergraduate uh, rankings in U.S. News and World Reports. Back when I was department head in the, the late 90s, there were four different rankings of schools, um, quality of schools, and the materials department was the only one at MIT that came in number one in all polls, okay, all four polls. And I used to kind of hammer the other department heads at Engineering Council and tell them, well, you know, we're the only ones who came in number one in all. You know, all the others who came in number one, I think mechanical engineering came in three out of four, okay? But they didn't, you know, one of them ranked them number two. So it turns out there is a bigger gap in materials between us and the, the next best school. However, having said that, to answer your question, uh, Northwestern has an excellent program. Colorado School of Mines actually never took the word metallurgy out of their title. Neither did University of Nevada, Reno, but they're sort of mining in metallurgy type thing. Um, but um, uh, Lehigh University is not bad um, in, in uh, metals. Um, uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic is not bad. Um, Berkeley's good in lots of things. I mean, they're one of the top. Northwestern and Berkeley are in the top five anyway. Stanford, forget them. Those are a bunch of electronic materials person people. They had one guy, Bill Nix, I think they still have him, but he's about 85, and he is Mr. Mechanical Metallurgy in the country. But, you know, okay, so tell me who the next person is. Okay, so does that answer your question? Okay. Um, and that's on video, and that'll be out for the world to see. Tom Eager's rankings, okay. Uh, so what, I mean, you don't have to believe what I say, but. Um, but you know, it really gets down in many cases when you go to graduate school, not necessarily what the best school is, but who's the best advisor, okay? Because there are people here at this institution that I would never work for, okay? I mean, you know, okay? They're jerks, okay? But I'm, I won't name those on video. <laughs> it goes public, okay? Uh, but if you come to me privately, I would tell you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, uh, well, why not? I mean, you know, I, uh, anyway. Uh, okay, so any other questions? Okay, so this is, I know it's not time to start, yeah. Uh, did you have that handout from last time? You know? um, here are some, here are extra copies of everything we've handed out from day one. Uh, and my secretary has made enough, for hopefully, for, of the two handouts for today. Everything is also on Stellar, so far as that goes, okay? Other questions? Okay. Um, so before we officially begin, here's a little culture for you um, out of Science Magazine from August 22nd. It always comes a little bit late to my office because we don't go get the mail all the time. Um, but Science Magazine is actually a pretty good reporting magazine. It's the magazine of the American Academy of Advanced, for Advancement of Sciences. And it's one of the few things I flop, flip through every week um, every month I read National Geographic. I don't read it, I flip through it, I like the pictures, ever since I was about six years old. Um, uh, the Economist, I look through every week. 
and Science Magazine. So anyway, here's an article on boosting GDP growth by accounting for the environment. And the whole thesis of this, written by some people from Cambridge, Massachusetts, and uh, someone from Middlebury College up in Vermont, is that uh, they define a gross external damages for, to the environment, a GED, and the cost of that on a national basis, and the environmentally adjusted value added, EVA, and they conclude between 1999 and 2008, the air pollution intensity of the U.S. economic output, the gross environmental damage divided by the gross domestic product, you know, how much money we make as a country, fell by one half from 6.4% to 3.2%. Only economists could give you two significant figures on something that we know to half a significant figure. But anyway, um, in any case, I'm sure they have worked out some sort of details. But the aggregate levels of annual growth rates from 1999 to 2008, the gross damage, gross uh, environmental damage, went dropped from 589, that's supposed to be in, I think it's supposed to be in million, billions of dollars, okay, down to $351 billion, so that's good. Environmental value added went from, uh, what do you say, yeah, eight trillion, uh, eight and a half trillion to seven and three quarters trillion, or ten and three quarters trillion. So that's good. The gross domestic product went from t nine to eleven trillion, uh, and you can take these ratios. But basically, if you want to say the the change, the growth in the gross domestic product in 2002, we actually added two and a half billion dollars, 2.76 and 1.18 billion dollars to the gross gross national product. They're arguing that we've actually been doing better. And that represents about 0.02 percent better. Okay, it's not a lot, but hey, two and a half billion dollars isn't eh, nothing. Okay, I mean, I'll, I'll take it. Okay, and basically, what their argument is is we're actually the cleaning up of the environment that we've been doing actually has a positive net benefit. Okay, economically. Now, I'm sure people could shoot holes at this, but I'm sure these economists have done a lot to. Uh, quantify and justify what, they, what they're saying. So being green is good business, okay, is the conclusion. And it added 0.02% to the gross domestic product over the last 10 years, okay. Not, not a lot, but hey, it's better than a sharp stick in the eye. Okay, that's just for culture. Um, the rest of you didn't miss anything who came on time, and so now I can start whatever we're gonna start. Anybody have any questions that, um, I'm gonna pass around this is the sign-in sheet. I now have 34 people on this. If your name's not on it, please sign, you know, just check and make sure my secretary asks me to do that because she wants to make the list of emails so that if we have to blast the class with an email because I get hit by a truck and won't be there the next morning, you'll know. Okay, next week I'll be lecturing Monday and Tuesdays. Dr. Belmar will be Wednesday and Thursday and I'll give you a Friday off. It's actually a student holiday. In the old days it was Yom Kippur, but they don't say anything religious anymore. That's forbidden, okay? But anyway, it's not completely correct. Okay, um, what were the takeaways? What were the takeaways I would hope you might have gotten? Maybe they weren't quite as explicit from last Monday as, uh, well, basically product in materials um, selection and stuff, productivity is everything. Now, Paul Krugman, anyone know who Paul Krugman is? Yes, who's Paul Krugman? Uh, he writes for the New York Times. He writes for the New York Times, but in fact he was an MIT, I think, pretty sure he was a graduate student here, became a faculty member in economics, uh, did a lot of good work, wrote some books um, to sort of counter uh, the dean of the Sloan School who was Lester Thoreau at the time. This was back in the 80s and 90s. And uh, um, then he went to Stanford and won the Nobel Prize. Okay, uh, and now I think he may be, I think you're right, he may be at Columbia or somewhere and, and writing for, you know, writing thing, news stories and stuff. But he is a Nobel laureate. He used to say productivity isn't everything, but it's nearly everything, okay? If you can shoot for one thing that's good in the world in terms of manufacturing, being the most productive, is the best thing you can do. And over the long haul, I'm gonna hopefully show you today, it's really good, okay? And we talked about steel, went from one person year to, per ton to about 20 minutes, okay? 
or three tons per person hour, okay? 20 minutes per ton. Okay, materials usage, cha usage changes over time. I gave you the, the Ashby plot. We actually handed it out. Oops, uh, that's the problem with using this thing. Um, and he goes back to 10,000 BC all the way up to 2020. He did all this kind of in the near midpoint here. This came out of a book in the 1980s. And he turns out to have been terribly wrong going forward. But as um, there's lots of debates about who said it. Um, but prediction is very difficult, if, especially if it involves the future. Okay, It's always better to predict the past. So different industries value materials differently. And I pointed out that uh, over, the va over the life of a vehicle, a pound saved in the automotive business is worth $2. In the, aeros in the airplane, commercial airplane business, it's worth $200. In the aerospace industry, it's worth $20,000. This is a piece of material from the aerospace industry. This is part of the shell. Other people have been in my class before. It's one of my um, sort of prized possessions. This is part of the um, X-33 space plane liquid hydrogen tank. Uh, cost $12,000 a pound to fabricate. It's nice and light, okay? Um, this is another one of my favorites. It's actually about a 30-year-old turbine blade. I'll pass it around. It's been split. They call it filleting, just for display. Pratt & Whitney gave me this. Uh, but it has internal cooling passages. This is a single crystal. If this was a good blade, it'd be worth six or $7,000, OK? It's not much good when they cut it open. And it's laser, it's uh, electron beam hole drilled at different angles, because anyway, it's, it's a nice story about that. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, on the other hand, we have railroads and shipping where things are worth about um, 20 cents a pound to transport. Uh, this happens to be part of a sub-zero freezer refrigerator. Anybody have a sub-zero freezer refrigerator at home? Nobody? Yeah, you do. Only costs $11,000, right, for that refrigerator. Nice refrigerator. It keeps the lettuce crisp. Uh, because it has separate humidity control, top and bottom in the freezer and in the refrigerator. Uh, my son has one. I don't have one. Uh, he bought a house that had one. Um, in any case, that's the hinge. Just plain old carbon steel. Um, and you can't spend very much on refrigerators. In fact, General Electric just sold Appliance Park. Anybody see that in the news earlier this week? Appliance Park and uh, outside of Cincinnati, Ohio, General Electric has this huge appliance manufacturing facility and they've had it for 40 or 50 years. Almost all the refrigerators, not all, but probably 75 or 80 percent, they make Sears, Kenmore, they make all kinds of brands, but it's all General Electric at that plant. And General Electric essentially manufactures for everybody, everybody else. Well, I think it was, who was it that bought it? A Swedish firm, I think. Uh, I can't remember which one. Pardon me? Uh, no, it wasn't. No. Anyway, I can't remember. I saw it I was, when I was traveling this week. I saw it somewhere. Anyway, so there's wide range in um, value of materials. Uh, one way to think about it is you don't think of aluminum as a new material in aircraft. Okay, we've been making aluminum aircraft since the 1940s. Actually, the engine in the Wright brothers uh, thing was an aluminum copper uh, aluminum copper alloy, okay, casting. Um, so they're even using aluminum on the first flight, um, and certainly in the, by the 1940s, many of the military aircraft were mostly made out of aluminum. Well, you know, it was a big deal in the 1990s, only 20 years ago, when Audi came out with all aluminum vehicles. Was that really a big deal? I could show you pictures of. Andrew Mellon of Carnegie Mellon Bank fame in the 1930s with his all aluminum Pierce Arrow. Okay, he could have Pierce Arrow, Arrow build him an aluminum Pierce, Pierce Arrow uh, car, luxury car, as opposed to a steel one because he was the investor for Alcoa. Okay, and he made a lot of money. Okay, off uh, off the aluminum business. So it wasn't that we didn't know how to make 
aluminum automobiles, but we didn't know how to make them cheaply, okay? Uh, in fact, we still don't know how to make an all aluminum Ford Taurus. Actually, we do know how to do it. We just can't afford to do it, okay? And I always say any fool can make an all aluminum $100,000 car, okay? Um, but making a $20,000 all aluminum car is a much bigger challenge. So we're going to get into some of those things. But one thing I did want to talk about today was who can tell me to finish up our economics lectures? What's the difference between productivity and competitiveness? If you don't know, it's okay because I went to a, uh, a review committee about two or three years ago down at the National Institute of Standards and Technology, which is the, in Gaithersburg, Maryland, which is the, the uh, Department of Commerce's laboratory. It's one of the best um, uh, laboratories, in, federal laboratories in, in the United States. Okay, we have over 700 federal laboratories and I consider this one to be one of the top two or three, okay? And so we were reviewing their manufacturing programs and they get up in that first morning and they're telling us that they are the laboratory for competitiveness in the U.S. You know, uh, industry, okay? And I said, after the talk, I said, do you mean competitiveness or do you mean productivity? Oh no, we mean competitiveness. I said, then I don't believe you in front of all these people, <laughs> okay? That's typical me, okay? Um, they said, what, what do you mean? I said, well, competitiveness means things like foreign exchange rates. You guys are, are interested in doing research on foreign exchange rates? Okay, how much, you know, how many yen to the dollar? How many euros to the dollar? Is that what you're doing? Because competitiveness involves things like that. It involves all kinds of externalities. Productivity is how efficiently can you make something, okay? How many dollars per pound or, you know, um, dollars per unit? Competitiveness has all these political, social, economic exter externalities. They maintained all through that morning and the break when I tried to politic and say, you guys, are you sure? Because um, I tried to be a little polite. Well, actually, I didn't try to be that polite. But anyway, um, they still maintain when I left there two days, after two days, that they were the United States doing research on competitiveness. And all I could say when they asked me to draft my report was that they didn't understand competitiveness. So there. Uh, so if you didn't understand the difference between productivity and competitiveness, that's fair. That's fair. But you should know that there is a difference. Okay. And that wraps up some of that. Now, um, I did want to talk about competition among materials. So if I talk about containers for holding liquids, and I didn't bring an example of everything, but there's a liquid, there's a liquid, and there's a solid, but I didn't have, that's what I found in my office. Okay. Um, so if I look at different types of containers, I could think of about six of them, most of which we are still using. Uh, but maybe we can talk about, we still we make steel. They call them, used to call them tin cans. Aluminum, there's a Sprite can right there. Glass, uh, so you can have a bottle of beer, okay. Ceramic, uh, plastic, and composite. Okay, so these are juice boxes, these are water bottles or Coke, uh, you know, plastic soda bottles or... Um, which of these are, which is the one that's hardly ever used anymore? It was actually the first one used. Ceramic, okay. What's the Achilles heel of ceramic as a container? Very brittle. Very brittle. It's also sort of heavy. You ever seen a thin walled ceramic stoneware whatever, right? Okay, you see them in museums now, but we really don't, I mean, they're heavy. So what's the Achilles heel of steel? It's, it's true of everything, everything I say good about steel, you can always hit and throw back at me and say, but it corrodes, okay? The reason they had to make tin cans is they would take a very expensive element, tin, and 
uh, give a very thin plating on the surface to give it any corrosion resistance. You put food in, in bare steel, you wouldn't want to eat it after a day. It'd be all rusty. Not that it would be harmful. Turns out iron oxide is non-toxic. They use it as the non-toxic control in rats, okay, when they do laboratory studies, okay. You can breathe iron oxide, you can eat it, okay. Um, but it does corrode. Aluminum. What's the Achilles heel of aluminum? Turns out it's more expensive than steel. Uh, it actually is probably one of the best. It doesn't corrode very much, okay? Uh, that's why we make how many a trillion aluminum cans each year? I mean, we make a lot of them because it's a material of choice here for containers. Glass, Kelly seal of glass, yeah. Yep. Aluminum, uh, we, I've got it a little bit later here, it's like fifth most abundant element on the Earth's crust. So there's no scarcity, scarcity of aluminum. Um, but it does take a lot of energy. And that's why the cost, that's why it's three times the cost of steel because it has six times the energy content. Okay. Aluminum is sometimes called, sometimes called canned electricity. Okay. One of my associates, a couple of my associates, just got back from Iceland where Alcoa put in a great big aluminum plant. Why would you put in a great big aluminum plant in Iceland? Because they have a lot of hydroelectric power. And you can't get it out of Iceland any other way. And in fact, the whole aluminum in industry had a tremendous problem 25 years ago um, because the former Soviet Union broke up. They were making a tremendous amount of aluminum which they weren't really sharing with the, the rest of the world. Uh, the, the Soviet Union wasn't sharing it very much. Uh, they were making it in Siberia, okay? But they needed foreign exchange. So what was the way to get all their hydroelectric power out of Siberia? Make aluminum. And so they flooded the world market. And all of a sudden, Alcoa and Alcan and Pechenet, which is the French uh, company, the big company started by the the other founder of how to make aluminum um, cheaply back in the 1880s. Um, uh, uh, and all the other aluminum companies, they just, they just started closing production facilities because the Soviets just flooded the market with this cheap aluminum. Because, hey, th otherwise, all that hy hydroelectric power is going to go down the river and into the ocean, okay? So there's an opportunity cost there. These are kind of externalities. But aluminum is a great material for storing things. Glass, what's the Achilles heel of glass? It actually has two. It's heavy like ceramic, and it also is fragile like ceramic, okay? But it still is a material of choice for some containers, like bottled beer. Why? It's, yeah. It has low thermal conductivity. Has low thermal conductivity, but actually the real thing is it reacts, it doesn't react with the product. It doesn't change the taste, okay, supposedly, okay. And well, it does so less than any of these others. It's very non-reactive, okay, very stable. Plastic, what's the Achilles heel of plastic? Thermal sensitivity. Yeah, thermal, well, it doesn't have any thermal capability. It also is expensive. It's about one, th it's lighter, even lighter than aluminum, but it's got twice the energy content uh, per pound as steel. Okay, so they make it thinner and thinner and thinner so that, you know, anyway, you know what I mean. Uh, but it's, hey, they make how many trillion bottles out of plastic each year? So the two big ones that we use today are these two. Composite, what do I mean by composite? Juice boxes, seven layers of material. Plastic, aluminum, I mean, they use aluminum foil in there, right? If you take, try to, you can't peel these things apart. They're bonded together. And you know what? The Achilles heel is recyclability. You either burn them or you put them in a landfill. That's it, okay? You cannot get those, you cannot recycle those materials other than to burn them up or bury them, okay? So juice boxes are environmentally not so hot. But one advantage, you can make them rectangular and you can stack them close together, don't have a lot of air in between, you know, I mean, there's, anyway. So, you actually start looking at this, the one that came first in society was ceramic, the one that came second was glass, the one that came third was steel, 
aluminum came fourth, plastic came fifth, and composites came sixth. So there's the rank ordering in time, chronologically. Steel, back in the 1880s. In fact, there's a guy, very, an MIT person, Samuel Prescott. Anybody who knows who Samuel Prescott it was? If you walk from building eight to building 16, going down, you know, as you came down the infinite corridor and you keep kind of wandering your way. I think there's a big placard there that everybody ignores. No, it talks about Samuel Prescott. He was one of the guys who perfected canning of foods in the 1880s. When I was a student, MIT had a food nutrition department. He got killed by, um, by a provost who didn't make president because he killed this department without bothering to tell them he was going to do it. But he was sort of, John Deutsch, he was, he was sort of a, a loose cannon anyway later head of the CIA. Um, anyway, so steel goes back 125 years, aluminum as container material goes back to probably the 1930s. Plastics really is the last 30 years that was big. I mean, we had them probably 40, 50 years ago, but plastics has kind of come on. And composites are the last 25 years or so. So if you think about that, you plotted the different materials over time, we are in this age of exploding numbers of materials and choices, which is why I can teach a course on material selection because, hey, if I was teaching this course in 5000 BC, I'd be telling you about ceramics, maybe glass, and certainly stone, okay? But the, the choices of materials choices were not so great, okay? But now we have all kinds of choices and people are always trying to up one another. It turns out um, uh, the aluminum cans are a lot thinner today than they were before. In fact, when you pop this and take the pressure out, all of a sudden it becomes almost as flimsy as a, as a plastic uh, water bottle, okay? This is a composite, by the way, okay? I just didn't have a juice box. Um, okay, so having said all that, what is the number, now that we've finished externalities, beyond externalities, which may be the deciding factors in selection of a material, oh, before I do that. I broke this at the end of class. This is a piece of plastic. If you want, you can fit it back together. Um, it tended to break down here at the stress concentration where it changes um, width. And it also broke with what we call a shear lip. You've got a negative shear lip here and a positive shear lip here. It's a brittle material. You can tell it's a brittle material because you can put it back together, okay, without lots of space in between. Um, so you can look at that if you want. What is the number one driver when we get to technology of materials in our selection of material? And you might say, well, this isn't a technological thing. It's something called cost. Okay, I, I've been talking about it off and on here, but it's the cost of a material. And somewhere here, I have a plot of, let's see it, oh, it's right here. I was about to show it to you. Um, this is out of the materials research for the 21st century paper. This is not my plot. This is a 1962 plot by Jack Westbrook, who was an MIT grad of this department, went off to General Electric Research, and he's now retired, lives somewhere here in New England, I think. Um, but Jack was looking at structural materials for General Electric and trying to give some big overview of what will be the structural materials for the future. And he put up together this plot in pounds per year versus dollars per pound. Now remember, this is 1962 dollars and pounds and stuff. But what's number one? Stone. Cement, wood, brick, st carbon steel. I mean, these are the things up here. Alloy steel is down here. Rubber, polyethylene, aluminum is right here. Okay, but this is a log-log scale. So, I mean, yes, it's a factor of 50 difference <laughs> between carbon steel and, and aluminum in volume, but hey, it's a log-log scale, but Steel's nothing compared to stone, okay? Um, actually, cement has passed steel in tonnage since 1962, and there's some reasons for that about the third world, but anyway. And you come down here to a structural material, diamond. 
is a structural material. Just happen to have some diamond to pass around. So here's a diamond. This is a, um, a pad, uh, pad conditioner. If you're gonna make semiconductors and you lay down different layers on top of the semiconductors, after a while you've laid down different layers of everything and, and you've done etching and stuff and this thing is now, now not flat anymore. So you need to planarize the semiconductor. And so you go in and you essentially take one of these diamond pads and you grind away some of the silicon that you just deposited with the copper and everything else. Here's, here's a, a little, um, uh, another thing which they basically braze man-made diamonds these are not natural diamonds man-made diamonds are better structurally than natural diamonds turns out we don't really have a shortage of diamonds in the world the diamonds are expensive anybody know why they're expensive it's an externality thing here yes who wants them to be expensive no the people who sell them okay people who buy them would like them to be cheaper they think but no, they don't really, you're right. They're sort of two-faced about it. They want them to be exclusive. But De Beers has a world monopoly, basically, on diamonds, okay? And they have vaults in London just full of diamonds, okay? But they only let them out at a certain rate because they've done all the economic studies of what's, how do you get the maximum profit depending on the supply. There's plenty of supply, then they drop the price and De Beers would not make as much money. So De Beers is controlling the diamond market. And they were really concerned when the Soviet Union broke up because all of a sudden the Soviet Union actually has some pretty good resources for diamonds, but they, they couldn't do much because people just steal them. Um, they're, too, they're too small and too easy to steal. Um, but anyway, diamond is a structural material. Man-made diamonds are actually stronger structurally because they don't have the defects that natural diamonds do. Anybody know anything about diamonds, the f what the four C's are? Carrots. Cut, carrot, clarity, and composition or something, I don't remember. Go look it up, four C's of diamonds, Just Google it. Anyway, um, but there's four things about the quality and the price of a diamond. So there's carrot, how, how big it is, you know, cut, which is how well did they make the facets, okay, if they kind of missed it, it doesn't sparkle as much. Clarity is how many pores and inclusions and all those other things that material scientists know about. Oh, color, color is the other one, okay, sorry, did you say color? Okay, yeah, okay. Well, speak up, speak up. Okay, cut, cut yeah, carrot, cut, clarity, anyway. Uh, those are the four C's of diamonds. Uh, so anyway. Uh, so diamonds are a structural material, and they're pretty pricey, okay, on a log scale. And in fact, this thing bends over probably because of De Beers. You know, it'd probably be an order magnitude cheaper if we didn't have this externality of De Beers. But the interesting thing about this plot is he has an ISO market size here, okay? Uh, and I never have quite figured out, I never have been able to quite reproduce this plot. Uh, over the last 10 or 15 years. But in, in any case, you see the usage slope is steeper than the ISO market slope, okay? And what does that mean in the long term? What that means in the long term, if your productivity, remember productivity is almost everything, according to Krugman, Tom Eager, it's everything, because um, I don't understand the other almost. Anyway, if you can improve if you can reduce your cost by a factor of two you will increase your volume of sales in the long run by a factor of four if you look at these slopes so what does that mean your market just became twice as big if you can cut your cost by half so productivity is worth something in the long run in the short run it can do you damage okay in the short run i told you the story about the the worldwide steel industry, their productivity shot up from the 1960s into the 1990s by a factor of six or seven. And their employment went, okay, because when you're eating 600 million tons of steel a year, you can't convince people to eat twice as much. So you end up with an oversupply, okay, and you get into these other externalities which happen to do with competitiveness, okay which I don't know anything about, okay, but, but I know it's important, okay. But nonetheless, 
And all the gurus on Wall Street said, the steel industry is dying. Well, who's dying? You idiots. It was a wonderful business, okay? And uh, what's Mittal's first name? Do you know? Anyway, anyway, anyway. Mittal, this guy in India, Mittal, goes around buying up steel companies for a song because everybody says, oh, the industry's dead. Okay? Ned Thomas, who was my associate head and a polymer guy, the whole time I was department, oh, metallurgy's dead. When Chris Hsu became a, a, a young faculty member here 14 years ago, and I was sort of advising him, I said, he said, I said, well, what's your specialty? He says, I'm a metallurgist. I said, oh, don't say that. Don't say that. Okay? The dean will just hate that. Because people like Ned Thomas, idiots like Ned Thomas. I said that you know, on, on, on tape, okay? He's dean at Rice University. That was MIT's big gain and Rice's big loss was when he left here to go to Rice, okay? He thought that steel was dead. And he used to go around preaching this, okay? Well, was he right? No, he was wrong. Any idiot, idiot who thinks about it would have known he was wrong. And I knew he was wrong, and I told him he was wrong. Okay, he didn't like that. And I, could, I, I ended up telling people, well, anyway. I wrote the Future Metals paper, and it turns out the people in the steel industries were being beat up so bad by all the people in Wall Street and everything. I wrote that paper in the early 90s. And they asked me at US Steel Research to come and give, a, give my talk. I was the first outside person to give this type of lecture. It was always internal people, which says something about the ingrown, inbred, not invented here nature of U.S. Steel research. But I gave this talk about why steel was important. I thought, that's a little strange. Why do I have to go to U.S. Steel research to tell them why steel is an important material? Okay, But I did. And about two years later, I was invited to the big conclave of the American Iron Steel Institute steel company presidents down in Orlando. I'd never been to a place like this before. This was a gated resort center, which I mean, you had to show all kinds of ID to get in, and it was palatial. I mean, this was just really nice you know, golf course right there. And this is where the presidents of the American Iron Steel Companies would go to confer with each other, to collude. I mean, uh, to, uh, no, it's illegal. Um, and I had to give a talk on the future of metals. And I thought, this really is silly, that I'm a professor at MIT, and I have to go talk to the presidents of the US steel companies to tell them why steel is an important material, OK? But it's a true story, OK? About that point, I decided, I, I, well, actually, at that point, it just reinforced why I decided early in my career that it was time to get out of the steel industry, OK? Um, that's another story. But let me tell you a little bit, give, let's go back to a history lesson here. So this I mentioned before, Out of the Fiery Furnace, and this is actually a PBS special. And um, I can, I'll just read some of it to you, but if you want, you can read some of it here. Uh, the, the problem was, well, actually, if you go back to the page before, um, they're talking about um, the shortage of wood. The effects were felt all over Europe, but the first country to reach crisis over, over the shortage of wood and charcoal was Britain for two reasons, main reasons. One, they had a limited area on an island, okay, um, but also um, uh, they had a fairly robust economy and there were two uses of wood. One was to make iron. You needed charcoal to be able to run your cast iron furnaces to make gun barrels and cannons and things like that. And you also needed to make ships of, of the line, okay? And that's where it's talking about this. The iron industry grew, grew as, as the iron industry grew, it generated not only trade, but conflict. The forests of Britain had long been admired for their most celebrated inhabitants, slow growing and long lives. These were the mighty oaks, okay? Um, for which centuries had provided the wooden walls of, of old England, the castles and stuff. Um, the crucial importance of the sea defenses of the British Isle Navy, looked at the Royal Dockyard was in Portsmouth, okay. Um, to make the AS, HMS Victory, Napoleon's flagship at Trafalgar, took 2,100 tons of oak. And that's the final product. It probably took twice that, and that's what went into the ship. Probably took two or three times that for all the shavings that you had to cut away. 
to make things in shape. A whole forest, okay? So the two uses of oak were in conflict, basically to make charcoal and to make ships. And now a third industry came along, glass making, okay? To make glass, you need a very clean source of fuel, which means you need more charcoal, okay? You need to cut down more forests. And I told you about um, how Saugus Ironworks came into being. And I don't know if I can get this. Yeah, okay. In 1558, a law was passed. This is before Saugus Ironworks, okay? Before 1600s. Was passed f forbidding the felling of trees to make coals for the burning of iron, but the weld of Kent and Sussex was exempted. What's the weld of S Kent and Sussex? That's where the big forests were with the big trees. So the politicians haven't changed over four or five hundred years. They pass a law and then they exempt what they're really trying to protect. Okay, come on. <coughs> okay. And still the price would contribute to continue to climb in 1559. Um, a writer complained that the price had ridden, risen from a penny to two shillings by reason of the iron mills. Okay, the shortage of wood was so serious a further act was passed forbidding the felling of trees within 22 miles of the Thames River, within four miles of the Great Forest of the Weld, and within three miles of the coastline anywhere. Because those big trees, you know, big trees have for the mass, you can't, they didn't have big tractor trailers and big interstate highways to bring them down the roads, okay? They had to carry those by horse and mule and ox and, okay. The decree effectively wiped out iron making industries of the weld. By 1615, England was facing an energy crisis. A royal proclamation that year lamented the disappearance of the kind of wood which is not only great and large in height and bulk, but hath also that toughness of heart as it is not subject to rive or cleave and therefore of excellent use for shipping, okay? So even then they knew about the difference between strength and toughness, okay? We lost that knowledge for about 350 years. We're gonna talk about that today, but nonetheless. And that was 1615, they were talking about that. And what did they do in the early 1620s? They come and build Saugus Ironworks because we had lots of trees, okay? So um, things have not changed that much over the years. Uh, uh, until they actually that's what the rest of the story is about until they started picking up coal here's a piece of coal okay that's from the MIT forge that's anthracite coal that's good coal okay kind we don't have much of but it burns very clean very low volatiles um, and basically they started picking up sea coal sea coal is when you had a coal seam comes up to the ocean, it would expose the sea coal, and the coal is light. It would float and, or you know, get washed up on the beach. So they had people walking up and down the, the beach, okay, picking up coal. And then they decided, well, they dig into some of those seams, and it got deeper and deeper, and they dug deeper and deeper, and they started getting water in, because, you know, because they go below the water table. So they had to build pumps. And there was a guy named James Watt, who basically started studying the efficiency of pumps for all you mechanical engineering types. And he wanted to know, because the owners of the coal mines wanted to know whether they were spending more money on the pumps to get the water out than the coal that they were getting, bringing out, okay? They, I mean, what, what's your efficiency factor here, okay? And so they actually, I don't know if this is all true, but they, they weave a nice story in this thing about this was the beginning of thermodynamics. They call it the revolution of necessity. Okay, because they didn't have any wood, they went to coal. And because they didn't have any, they, they had to mine coal efficiently and be productive about it, productivity again, they had to have water pumps. And because they had water pumps, they, they had to understand the thermodynamics of, of engines. Okay, I don't know if I follow all that, but nonetheless, it's a nice story. Okay, and it made a good PBS special. Okay, questions? So there are um, a number of structural materials, um, but the, the real tonnage structural materials, the ones that are a billion tons or more, okay, a year, stone, steel, blah, 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 we talked about that. Here they are in the periodic table. I've highlighted them in yellow, okay? It's not very much of the periodic table that we really use for structural materials, folks, if you're talking billion ton quantities per year. There is carbon, that's called wood, okay, right? There is silicon, that's called stone. There's aluminum, which is stone 
and it doesn't quite make it in the metals category for a billion tons a year, okay? But it's there because it's part of stone. Iron is a billion tons. Calcium and magnesium, that's called cement, okay? And that's it. Count them on a little more than one hand, okay? Now, how valuable, how plentiful is all this stuff? Well, the relative value of these things, like silicon, there's silicon, uh, polycrystalline silicon um, that was grown, or is actually heated and cooled over a six week period in a furnace to make very large grain size. And in fact, it's cut up, they make a boule of it that's about this big, okay, uh, of silicon, and they cut it up into little chunks and they make solar cells out of it. All this technology is developed right here in New Hampshire by a company. Um, and they make the equipment and they sold um, se hundred, several hundred of these machines to China because the government of China decided to invest $30 billion in solar cell technology. Well, that's not structural material. That's a functional material. This is something that they're now making since they, once you saturated China with the, the equipment that's going to cause them to, to knock our socks off in, in competitiveness, right now, solar cell business, and all the solar cell companies in the United States are going out of business, right? Um, that's sapphire, aluminum oxide, okay? Just another form of aluminum oxide, fifth most abundant element in the Earth's, Earth's crust. They now have, to, that, the silicon's done it. 1600C, this is done at 2100C. It gets a little hotter, and it's a bigger furnace. And they make a bull about this big, which is worth about $100,000. And they cut it up into little, little substrates, just like the silicon for semiconductors. Anybody know what the little SiO2 sub, or the uh, AL203, the sapphire substrates are? Are used for? LEDs, you ever heard of an LED? Every little LED has got a little piece of sapphire. They also use sapphire, for, this is sapphire, that watch face, right? They were going to bring out the iPhone 6 with a sapphire uh, uh, cover. Uh, they haven't done it yet. It's just a little too pricey to get something that big in sapphire. But it won't scratch. Never had a scratch problem. Why? Because aluminum oxide, also known as corundum, on the hardness scale is right below diamond. Okay, super hard, scratch resistant. It'll scratch almost anything else. Most of you haven't even thought why your watches don't scratch, did you? You don't have a watch. Oh, well, but very few scratch watches. When I was a youth, okay, I mean, even, we even had sapphire watch faces when I was your age, okay? But in the 50s and 60s, if I had a watch, it would get scratched up because it was glass, okay? And it would break but they switched to sapphire. So sapphire is actually pretty cheap. That little chunk of sapphire, if you weren't gonna make it into a bunch of LED substrates, uh, and that one's too small to, to cut efficiently, but uh, uh, it's probably worth a dollar or two, okay? All you have to do is melt it and cool it over about a two month period. You get big grain size. Okay, um, so there is a difference between Structural materials, which I want to talk about in this course. See, this is a long introduction. Um, and functional materials. Structural materials are usually huge volumes. Okay, that makes them different than silicon bulls for solar cells. And I didn't even talk about silicon for single crystal silicon for uh, semiconductor chips. Um, but, uh, or sapphire bulls to make LED lighting chips, which function, those are functional materials. They have certain properties, coefficient of thermal expansion in the case of sapphire, scratch resistance in terms of sapphire for watch faces. Structural materials, mostly they just need to have mechanical properties. And that's why a number of people in here are mechanical engineers, okay? You're interested in structural materials. And structural materials are still important in spite of what Wall Street or the Wall Street Journal think, okay? Structural materials, large volumes, millions of tons, okay? Mechanical, tensile, you know, the mechanical properties, that's what structural means, okay? 
tensile compressive, shear, creep, corrosion, ductility, toughness, fatigue. Functional materials, on the other hand, every type of property you can think of. And you get, not only do you have, you can talk, think of chemical, electrical, thermal, optical, you know, and then you start putting properties together like piezoelectric, which is mechanical and electrical, or magnetothermic, okay, or thermoelectric, or electrochemical. Okay, the, um, there are a host of functional materials, and we always hear about these things because we hear, always hear about the tremendous growth rate in silicon and Moore's Law and things like that, where the functionality has been, growth has been tremendous. If I show you magnets, okay, here's magnets. Or no, I'm sorry, this is optical fibers. This is optical fibers. This is actually the one I show first because this was put together by Bell Labs a number of years ago, 25 years ago. Um, and they showed the optical loss in decibels per kilometer. Egyptian glass was sort of green and smoky and anyway, wasn't very clear. Phoenicians did a better job by a couple of orders of magnitude in transmissivity of light. Optical glass by the time of Lewin Hoke and all these other guys, you know, um, you could actually look through them and wear glasses. And then in the 1960s, whew, glass fibers. This is sort of a nonlinear time scale. But glass fibers, and so we, we go here over eight orders of magnitude in transmissivity. And so now we can have light, light going down optical fibers um, most of the way across the ocean. Okay? We can look at magnetic properties. I already passed around my my magnets. This, this all kind of came out of a book written, actually edited, not edited, but created by Professor Flemings um, back when he said of the department called Material Science Engineering in the 1990s. Okay, so early 1991 this book came out. And this is the BH product, the magnetic field squared. And here's your samarium cobalt magnet, neodymium iron borons way up here above 40. Actually, it's above, it's above that. Oh, no, it's not. I thought this was a nonlinear scale. It is a nonlinear scale again. Anyway, tremendous growth. What does it mean? I already mentioned to you what it means. If I look at the old Alnico magnets from the 1930s, in order to have a certain mag magnetization uh, magnetic field, this is a thousand gauss at five millimeters from the pole face. You have to have 11, 12 cubic centimeters of Alnico. Alnico 9 is a little better. You get up here to neodymium iron boron, you never see them as big, fat, long magnets um, because you don't need it. Geometrically, you have a drop of a factor of, what's that, 50 or so in volume. And so now all of your um, motors and things like that, you know, when, I, when the Sony Walkman first came out, you had to change the battery, this is the 1980s, you had to change the batteries about every two or three hours. Now, who would lift, who would, who would listen to, you know, uh, an MP3 player right now if a battery lasted two or three hours? You know, you get lots of time out of these things now. Uh, other materials were the functional materials. This is actually a structural material. Um, this is the firing temperature of engines. I've got my, my turbine blade going around there somewhere. This is versus time. The firing temperature, the higher the temperature, the more efficient the engine. And these are the materials capabilities. Okay, this is an interesting one here, GTD 111. Here's a sort of broken GTD 111 uh, fan blade. Um, this is directionally solidified GTD 111. So, in General Electric came up with this alloy in the uh, uh, 1980s and it was improved alloy and we got single crystal blades like I'm showing up you know passing around and the firing temperature of the air engine goes goes up 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 but finally they couldn't get any better until they went to air cooling that's those air passages through that blade and you had a tremendous jump now remember that every 50 degrees here is two billion dollars a year's fuel savings for the airlines so there's a lot of impetus behind us to come up with better alloys. But we sort of have hit a brick wall. Back in the 1950s, this guy, Nick Grant, here was a professor. He's the one who taught me creep and high temperature materials when I was a student. He was one of the guys who was helping to develop a lot of these things. 
some of these alloys that you see here, hey, they're graduates of this department or pro assistant professors who went off to Pratt & Whitney or General Electric and developed these alloys. But they sort of ran out of steam, literally, <coughs> um, and then they came along here. But GTD-111 is a very interesting material. There's an interesting externality about it. When they first came out of it, the composition just wasn't patentable. So General Electric didn't, didn't patent it. However, in about 1986, they filed a patent for a heat treatment of it that gave it the best properties. And the patent office refused it. Well, in the meantime, everybody else started using it. It was one of the best alloys. Okay, and they started using it. And so by 1997 or so, everybody had incorporated this GTD-111. This is in land-based turbines. And you can see that turbine blade's a little heavy for, for a to fly. They incorporated it in all kinds of turbine designs and lo and behold 20 years after they filed for this patent or 15 years after they filed for the patent, the patent office finally allows this heat treatment option and everyone else is now infringing on General Electric's patent. And so there was a, a big scramble to try to figure out what to do because you designed your whole turbine around the properties of this material and now General Electric is going to be asking you for royalties. So I actually had a student do a master's thesis on this for a company that refurbishes engines. And we found that if you did hot isostatic pressing, you could take an old blade and rejuvenate it with a fancy heat treatment. And so it didn't become as big a problem as some people thought. But well, boy, when that patent first issued, there were a lot of scared competitors to General Electric because they had been using this alloy for 15 years. Okay. Any questions on that? So I'll be here tomorrow, and I'm now only about one full class or a class and a quarter behind. But it doesn't really matter. <laughs>